Good afternoon. My name is Guy, and I'm from Vectorblocks. And uh, this is about work that I've done uh, in conjunction with uh, Lattice Semiconductor, where we built a, a person detector system as a demonstrator. And it's actually been running in my pocket all day, and it's being powered from my cell phone battery. And what it does is it looks for you in the field of view, and if it sees you, it turns the LED on. Now, this person detector system is using our RISC-V processor that we call ORCA. It's using our set of vectors that we call SVE. And it's using a convolutional neural network accelerator. And I'll explain how all of that works. And it's really tiny. It's less than 5,000 lookup tables. And these are four input lookup tables, not the six input lookup tables you've heard about from other talks. That's the complete system, the ORCA, the vectors, and the accelerator, and the camera controller and everything. And it's around five milliwatts of power. Now, just to make it clear, we're going to be talking about vector instructions, and these are not the same as the vector instructions that are under consideration with the uh, RISC-V uh, working group. So why did we build this? We're motivated by different applications where we're trying to build a smarter world. So uh, how many people have tried uh, sending a text message in bed and fallen asleep at the wheel? Maybe accidentally hit the send button in the process of your sleep, and you send something like Café Féve out as a tweet. It would be really good if your cell phone didn't send the message if you weren't actively looking at it at the time. Save you from a lot of embarrassment. Also, pizza guy, Amazon guy comes with a handful of boxes to your door. He doesn't want to ring the doorbell. Um, you want it to recognize there's someone there and ring the doorbell automatically. And maybe you're watching TV and you want the TV to stay on as long as you're watching it. But as soon as you leave the room to go to the washroom, there's no need to leave the TV on while your dog is there watching a football game. So you can turn it off. And then my favorite, I love Star Trek doors. How many people like Star Trek doors? <laughs> yeah. Star Trek doors open up automatically when you come to them, right? Except what if you have a killer robot on the loose intent on killing people, and the Star Trek doors keep on opening for the robot? No, just open for humans, please, not robots. So this is our prototype. It's an FPGA, which is about 2.5 millimeters on the side. And it's got one megabit of SRAM. Everything is run on chip. And it's a camera, which is about the same size physically. It's a VGA resolution, but we downscale it because we only need 32 by 32 pixels to find a person. So here's a, a short video demo. Let's hope the video works. Uh, the green LED is going to be on when it sees me. And I'm going to move away, and the green LED will turn off. The blinking is a heartbeat to indicate every frame that it captures. So there, it doesn't see me anymore, but it's got a heartbeat. And then you come back, and it picks me up again. In order to do this, we had to do some deep learning. And so we had to build a database of people. So we grabbed a bunch of faces and built our own database. And then you need a counter database of not people. And so we built another database of not people. That one was actually remarkably harder than the people. And then we had to train a neural network, and we were inspired by this work by binary, called Binary Connect that uh, did a 10-category categorizer uh, using 1-bit weights and 32-bit floating-point activations. And they got a 92% accuracy. We built our own custom database for one person. Uh, we reduced the float 32 to int 8, and we got it to be 98% accuracy uh, with 40 times fewer computations. And that's what we put into the hardware system. Here's the complete hardware system. There's a camera that does downscaling and DMA into a scratch pad. There's a, a spy ROM that has all the weights, and we transfer the weights from there into the scratch pad. And then everything is run off of the on-chip scratch pad. We have a RISC-V core that we call ORCA. It's written in VHDL. It's available open source under a BSD license to anyone that wants to use it. It's fully portable. We've run it on five different FPGA vendor platforms. It's very fast on high-end FPGAs. It's over 200 megahertz, and it's fully pipelined. And it's small. It can be less than 2,000 4 input lookup tables. It's also highly parameterized and configurable. We also add to that some streaming vector extensions and our, our binary CNN accelerator. So how do our vector extensions work, and why are they different? So we start with a RISC-V processor accessing data memory over a bus. What we do is we isolate the ALU from the RISC-V, and we want to reuse that for our vectors. We want to stream data through that same ALU. So we grab the inputs and outputs, and we attach it to a stream memory. This stream memory is just like the data memory 
It's just in a different address space. So it's address mapped by the CPU. It can read and write through load and store instructions to that stream memory. But it can also stream the data through the ALU every clock cycle with hardware address generators. That makes it very efficient. Every clock cycle is a real piece of work that's being done. You use C to program this, and you just allocate data using a special malloc call to say, I want it to be in the stream memory, not in the regular memory. And then you could copy data back and forth. The important thing is all the vector operations occur only on the stream memory, not on the regular data memory. So let's take a look at these vector extensions in the RISC-V context. We have the regular RV32i instruction set, the base integer instruction set. What we do is we add streaming to all of those arithmetic operations. Now if you add the multiply extensions, we also can add vectorized version of those multiply operations. Now we also have to add a few more instructions. We need conditional move and move and uh, set greater than instructions. We have eight custom instructions in order to add custom accelerators. We use two of them for a neural net, one to preload the weights and one to do the evaluation. And then we have some control instructions to set the vector length, the stride of the address generators, and to query aspects of the CPU. One nice thing about this is there's a PACSIMD proposal being uh, looked at for RISC-V. Um, we can support that naturally already with our vectors. All we have to do is add to the specification to say we want to do byte and half word operations using the same instructions below. Furthermore, we need, uh, we'd like to add an extra optional extension, which is for DMA, to copy data directly from the off-ship or the, the on-ship data buffers into the scratch pad and have that run asynchronously so you can double buffer all of your uh, data movement and hide the memory latency. This extended, uh, this is vector instruction set is two parts. There's a base part, which is fully encoded into 32-bit single opcode slot using custom zero. And we do one and two D vector and matrix operations. And we support uh, PAX SIMD. On the hardware sense, we have uh, just the ALU of the RISC-V being used here, but we can have a separate implementation that has a separate bank of ALUs. And we've built up to 128 ALUs in parallel for this. An extended instruction set. Uh, uses a 64-bit encoding, and it adds more rich data types like floats and type conversions. It also adds 3D vectors, and it adds mask execution so that you can bypass no-op slots, and so they take up no time on the CPU. Here's an example of a fur filter written in regular RISC-32 code on the left in red, two nested loops, and in the vector code on the right. The inner loop is a single instruction in the vector code. The entire double nested loop takes 72 bytes of code in RISC-32. It takes 16 bytes of code in our vector code. Also, we get one instruction or one operation every clock cycle out of this with one ALU. Um, but the RISC-V has some address generator and loop overhead, so, and load and store instructions which can miss in the cache. And so you've got at least eight instructions and possible stalling from dependent dependents and from cache uh, misses. Now, how do we add custom streaming accelerators to this? This is one of the most powerful features of this. We can just redirect the data into a domain-specific streaming pipeline. So instead of sending it to the RISC-V ALU, we can generate our own bank of ALUs that have two inputs and one output as a model, and then redirect the inputs and outputs and stream it from that stream memory source. And we use the exact same programming model as the vectors. All the data movement is all taken care of. And there's no extra stuff in terms of the programming API from a software point of view. It's very clean and very performant. So here's how we do our convolution accelerator. Here's an image. What we do is we'll load four pixels of eight bits each in a, in a word. That might be in register RS1. And then we'll do, load the next four adjacent pixels in RS2. And what we're going to do is build up a history buffer of three rows in the accelerator. And then we'll progress down a column. And our address generators will stride row by row, and we'll fill up those buffers. Now what we can do is a convolution on a 3 by 3 region and generate an output result and put that in the byte of our output destination. We can add additional convolution operators in parallel. And so here we have 80 operations every clock cycle being done. At 24 megahertz, we get one cycle per instruction with this RISC-V processor. And we get about a 71 times speed up overall. That's effectively a 1.6 or 1.7 gigahertz RISC-V core. We use vector instructions to do the max pooling, the activations, 
and the fully connected layers of the neural network. And we use the, the convolution just for the convolutions. And the power envelope is five milliwatts. This whole thing is less than 5,000 lookup tables. The uh, RISC-V core is the biggest part. The vectors are about half the size of the RISC-V core. And the convolution is about the same size as the vectors. Here's the output. Um, we were showing this with a database of 10 different categories, and it detects a person very strongly. There's two results, one for float32 and one for int8, showing that we result, give the same result. And it finds airplanes, it finds dogs, and it finds people. We use just the people version here. Now, this morning, I opened up my goodie bag, and I got this beautiful RISC-V t-shirt, and I got inspired by it. It said, instruction sets want to be free. So our big announcement at this workshop is we're releasing our vector instruction set as an open specification. And we've recently joined the RISC-V vector extension working group. And we'll discuss this as a possible alternative, maybe not as a replacement for, but maybe a parallel alternative uh, vector instruction set to be considered for RISC-V. Why would you want to consider this? Well, first of all, it goes against conventional wisdom because we're a memory-to-memory -memory execution engine, not a register-to-register -register one, not a load store conventional risk. But there's a number of advantages from this that are very important. We have no named vector registers in our instruction set. We use C pointers exclusively to point to the vectors that point into the streaming memory, and those are stored in the scalar registers. That means we don't have a register allocation phase. We have not changed the compiler at all. For performance, it gives us the advantage of free loop unrolling. It gives us uh, an ability to compose software functions. One library can call another library that's accelerated without having to save the vector data. All it does is it uses that streaming memory, that scratch pad, in a stack-like fashion, and it allocates new data on the stack, and then it returns the result on the stack. We've written examples that have up to 10,000 times speed up. That's on an n-body problem where we added a custom accelerator to do the n-body force calculation. We've also gotten 1,200 times speed up against an ARM core, a hard ARM core, but ours is running on an FPGA fabric. Another advantage of this is we don't waste any storage in the streaming memory. We have any number of vectors of any length in there of any alignment. So the vectors are fully packed, and any subword data elements are fully packed. There's no internal fragmentation. Also, if you're not using the vectors, you're free to use that as a scratch pad with software. So it can be reused and repurposed. Finally, we believe the hardware is simpler because we use double buffer DMA to do data transfer in high latency, so you don't need to build a hardware prefetching engine or a register renaming engine. That's all. <laughs>